Um, it's great to be here. And as Brady said, uh, my wife Jessica and I, we live, we actually live in Shoreline, just north of Seattle, uh, where we've been for two years now. Yeah, two years. Um, working with the Navigators. If you're not familiar with the Navigators, it's a ministry that uh, shares the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and then helps people grow in their relationship with Jesus through life-to-life, person-to-person discipleship, and uh, all with the goal of seeing spiritual generations um, come out of that. And so, uh, specifically, we're working with international students up in that part of Seattle, and uh, just so thankful for what the Lord's given us and this opportunity to share with you all again. I think the last time we were here was December. I was looking on my calendar and I thought, oh, surely there's been the time between now and then, but I think that was the last time. And so uh, it's nice to be with you again after some several months. And as Brady said, we're going to jump right back or continue in Ephesians uh, chapter four. Uh, Pastor Scott told me you've been going through that for a few months now. And we're going to look at that together, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 17 through 24 today. And so, you know, as we look at that, um, it occurs to me that for those of you who are parents here, um, especially parents with little kids, it's much fresher. Uh, there's this concern here when children are learning to walk, right? Uh, and maybe if you're a first-time parent, you're looking at, oh, when will they walk? And can't wait for him to get up. And then, and then we say, oh, wait, why did I wish that? I wish they were just still crawling and not as, as mobile and getting into all these things, right? But there's that concern um, that they're walking correctly. And we always have that first tragic accident where they fall down and bonk their head and, uh, oh, no, they've stumbled. But as I look to the passage that we're looking at here this morning, uh, it occurred to me that Paul, as the, the parent, uh, spiritual parent or spiritual father here of many of these believers, uh, he's also concerned with the spiritual children, the church here in Ephesus, um, with their walk. Um, and we're going to look at that, uh, I believe, a couple, several weeks ago when uh, you were in the first part of Ephesians 4, uh, you looked at that idea about a worthy walk. Um, and here Paul returns to that theme, and really the, the whole second half of Ephesians here is concerned with that, of the walk of the believer, um, or rather the life of the believer, a walk used in a figurative sense of Um, That we're on a journey walking with Jesus through this life, but it's all of the activities of our life in Christ. And so what does that look like? What does this new walk look like? So we're going to look at that together. Um, I want to read uh, verses 17 through 24, and I'll be reading through a New American Standard Version. It says, So I say this and affirm in the Lord that you're no longer to walk just as the Gentiles also walk. In the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves up to indecent behavior for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the, old self, of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now let's just pray as we open God's word. Father, uh, we thank you for your word here. We thank you for this journey through Ephesians and And as uh, we look at this really critical part of uh, this letter here to the to the church, um, we pray, God, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, uh, give us wisdom to not only understand, but then to apply these things to our lives. Help us see, God, where we need to trust you and believe the gospel um, in order to live these things out. And Father, that you would do your transformative work in us by the power of your spirit, changing us more and more into the image of your son. Uh, So just thank you for your word here this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, Paul's concerned here with how these believers walk, how they live. 
Uh, that figurative term of walk encompassing all the activities of their life. We first saw it in chapter 4, verse 1. Um, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Um, in fact, actually, we saw it before in Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, speaks of the good works that we should walk in them, right? Um, and this second half, though, chapter 4 onward in, in the letter of the, to the Ephesians, is really concerned with this practical outworking in the life of these people who are in Christ. And for you and me here today, um, for those of us that have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, this has a lot to say with how does that work out? How does that look on a day-to-day basis? It's not just the things that we believe about who God is and what he's done, although those are critical and foundational and super important. But now it's how do we then live differently? How do those things affect our daily lives. And so thinking, trying to put ourselves here in the shoes of of what Paul's talking about, um, he's got this thing which we often see in his letters of comparing and contrasting, and he's comparing them now as believers in Jesus, as the church, with Gentiles. And yet at the same time we think, well, there are Gentiles here in this church, right? Um, This church is comprised like all the churches that Paul wrote to of believing Jews and Gentiles, come together as the body of Christ. And yet, he doesn't refer to them as Gentiles. He refers, um, he's talking about the Gentiles also walk. Um, The nations walk. And and the, the idea then is he's referring here to unbelieving Gentiles. Many of which who are reading or hearing this letter being read to them were not too long ago in that same camp. And now our first generation believers in Jesus Christ, um, they've come into this relationship. And so this portion begins by telling them what their lives should be, how their lives should be different than what it used to be before they trusted Christ. And he begins then by detailing the walk or the life of those unbelieving Gentiles. And I just want us to consider some of how they're described, um, because I think this is important here. Uh, And really, as I studied this this week and leading up to this week uh, to share with you, I was just impressed with the very dire description here, right, that we read about those that are still unbelieving. It speaks of how the Gentiles walk there in verse 17 in the futility of of their minds, um, that their uh, one translation I think says something like hopelessly confused. Right? There's this this futility. There's an emptiness, a vanity of how those apart from Christ perceive themselves and the world around them. Um, a word that's used here, this futility, uh, it can be thought of as human uh, nothingness. Uh, not nothing in the sense of uh, just an emptying of the mind, but a nothingness in sense of effect, of really having any eternal value and weight. Um, it, it's a, it's a something that results from worshiping that which is not God. Um, Paul, keep your place here in Ephesians, but turn back to Romans 1. Paul uses similar language here in Romans chapter 1 when he's describing the... <clears throat> The condition of the lost world, the condition of um, the peoples who have turned away from God, right? And in Romans chapter 1, I want us to uh, start in verse 20, and we'll read through verse 23. Romans 1 verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived being understood by what has been made, so that they, that is, the, those that reject God, they are without excuse. Verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasoning. Similar language of what we just read in Ephesians 4. And their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They became fools. 
and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. And it goes on to describe in much more detail the condition and the state of humanity and the world who has rejected God. But here, Paul, in, back in Ephesians 4, Paul's picking up a little bit of that when he speaks of the futility of their minds, the darkness of their understanding, that this is a result at the heart of it of misplaced worship, right? Even, even if, um, in, now in Paul's day, it was very real, the, the physical idolatry that existed. And you can go into these uh, temples and see these things. And um, there's still places in the world where that exists. We lived 12 years in Thailand. And I, the very first time I was there, uh, I think I was shocked because I thought, oh, I thought this type of idolatry was just in the Old Testament. And yet as you walk into the Buddhist temples, you see very clearly the images and idols of worship um, from the people. But it's not just that form, right? It's anything that takes the place of God, takes the place of Jesus, the only one who rightly deserves that elevated place of worship in our hearts and lives. And Paul's saying that because of that, the reasoning, the confusion, the the emptiness, the vanity, the darkness, um, they're darkened in their understanding. Light and darkness are often symbols in Scripture, right, of, of that which is true and good and understanding is light and, and then the darkness is confusion and evil and uh, the lack of knowledge. And so Paul here goes on to describe what these Gentiles are like, what their walk is like, what I'm sure as many of them could relate to having just come out of that way of life, they're like, oh yeah, that's familiar. Um, Maybe even so an advantage over you and me today, right? I mean, if you've grown up in the church, uh, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I I can remember as a kid going to church camp and um, our counselors would share around the campfire at night and they'd share these testimonies and uh, some of them would just be these, wow, radical, life-changing, you know, recently I was whatever, my life, and then God saved me, and they describe a little bit of what their life was like before that, and I thought, wow, I don't, mine is really boring. I don't have a good testimony, because I grew up in the church, I grew up in um, a family that loved Jesus, and I came to know Christ as a little kid, and so, you know, before I was four or five years old, I wasn't out, you know, doing drugs and having this terrible life, and, but, and so if we've grown up like that, um, Maybe it can be hard to relate to this type of description that Paul's giving here. But maybe for some of you, you've come to Christ later in life and you can say, yeah, this was, this was what it was like. And he goes on to describe in verse 18 how they're excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance in them, the hardness of their heart. Lacking true knowledge, not sensitive to the things of God. Um, Their past, uh, it says in the next verse, callous, uh, past feeling, insensible to honor and shame. What is it, what is it really like? They, they've seared their consciences, so to speak. And uh, at the heart of all of it, it seems that is what it says in verse 18, that they're excluded from the life of God. They're alienated. They're separated. There's this distance between them and the God who created them. There's not a relationship there. They're disconnected from the life of God. They're disconnected from the God who gives life, right? And it seems that this is this prideful sense then um, that Paul's honing in on, this prideful sense of self-importance, of attempting to derive lasting value and meaning apart from the Creator, of failing to submit to God's wisdom, and ultimately the worthlessness that results from not knowing God. Not that the unbeliever cannot have good thoughts or discover truth. All truth is God's truth. Not that they cannot... um, do good things in the sense of loving their neighbor and loving people, but 
but ultimately, it's disconnected from God. And so ultimately, it has no lasting eternal value. Ultimately, it's, well, this futility, this nothingness, right? And, and one author described it this way, um, because of the nothingness, right, that's there, a human nothingness, it, before this reason, we must look to God with whom alone is no nothingness, is no futility, is no vanity. In other words, all of these other attempts to fill it in in all these places fall short of the one with whom there is supreme meaning and value. And so, as a result of all this, right, um, as a result of the ungodly inner life that Paul's describing here, futility in their minds, darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, ignorance, hardness of their heart, becoming callous. These are all describing the inner life, right? The nature, the, the very identity of these people that he's warning them, don't walk like them, don't live your life like them. But as a result of all that's going on inside, there is this now ungodly behavior and practice, right? Of verse 19. Having given themselves up to indecent behavior, for they practice every kind of impurity with greediness. And we'll see the same thing when it comes to describing, um, although it's a briefer here, uh, but when it comes to describing those of us who are in Christ, we'll see the same thing that Paul focuses first on what's inside, what's our nature, what's our identity, and then from that outward to the actions and the lifestyle and the behavior, right? And it occurred to me as I was looking at this, just how critical it is that we understand this, or we are reminded of this reality. Um, it's so tempting, I think, for us at times to focus just on our behavior. Um, and again, if I can think to, especially for us who have, have grown up in the church and have um, known about this since we were young, there's at times this temptation that we make it just about what we can see on the outside, and that be the primary uh, focal point. And yet, Scripture over and over again, we see that sinful actions and behavior come from a sinful heart. Right? Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 15. He said, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. It's this whole discussion where the, I think some of the Pharisees and religious leaders were talking about, you guys are drinking from these dirty cups and you're defiling yourself. And he says, no, 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 you've got it backwards. The things that come um, out of the mouth come from the heart. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. It's Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19. And that theme we see running throughout the scripture that, that it, yes, there is behavior that's bad. Yes, there's practice and pattern that is ungodly and not pleasing to him. But those are results of the real problem. And as we're reminded in this passage, the real problem is what's going on inside. And so with that understanding, it's no surprise then that <laughs> this is the very reason that the solution that God has for us, the good news of the gospel in Jesus, is not just to improve our behavior, not just make us um, better people in the eyes of, oh, they really are doing good things, but rather to make us completely new from the inside out, Right? Because if the gospel is only a behavior modification and somehow fixing our actions, then we've failed to really get at the core root of the problem, and that is our very nature of who we are. Because once that's addressed and once that's made new, then that has the effects on the actions. And I think that's part of what we're reminded of here when we look how Paul describes those that are alienated from God. 
There's something wrong inside, and because of that comes out these sinful behaviors and actions. So that's the, the bad news, so to speak, right? Those first few verses. And uh, if we were to just close it here and go home, um, I don't know what time we usually do that, by the way, but anyhow, uh, people will start leaving, I guess. Um, but if we were to just stop, then it would be really sad. And yet, verse 20 here, right? Um, <laughs> With this contrast and and one of the most beautiful words in all of scripture, but you did not learn Christ, but God, right? We see that over and over again. We saw it earlier in Ephesians chapter two, you know, describing the the lost nature and then verse four, but God being rich in mercy. And so here's the description, Paul says, of, of these unbelieving Gentiles and how they walk and how they live, but there's something different about you. Right? And we see that every description that we just looked at in verses 17 through 19, every description of the unbelieving Gentiles has been turned upside down, or rather, maybe we should say right side up in the person of Jesus Christ. And that we've been transformed by Christ in these areas, right? Um, He's addressed some of this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. He's praying for them, praying what? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you'll know what that is the hope of his calling. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That, that darkness and that confusion and that futility, he says, no, no, no. Now you've got something. Now there's meaning. Now there's purpose. Now there's light. Now there's glory. There's hope. There's revelation, there's knowledge, it's no longer ignorance. That separation that he described here, alienated or excluded from God, he talked about that back in chapter 2, right? How here in verse 11 in chapter 2, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded or alienated from the people of Israel, strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so all of this description, all of these things that are wrong within the nature and identity of those without um, that, that they were, that we were, Paul saying, now all those things have been transformed and changed in the person of Jesus. That our worship has shifted significantly from that which is futile and meaningless and empty and nothing to the one who is the source of life, their substance and fullness. Our hearts are now, rather than hardened, Rather than calloused, rather than unfeeling and insensitive, our hearts now are made soft by the grace of God. I I love this picture that we see in uh, the prophet Ezekiel. And and granted, Ezekiel here, it's uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, if you want to note it. I'm just going to read it. But in Ezekiel 36, um, Ezekiel's delivering a message from Yahweh the Lord to his people Israel, right? And he's telling him what he's going to do for them and, and, and where they're at. And, and it's a promise for them. And yet I can't help but think, whoa, God has done the same thing for us in such a greater way for those of us who trust in Jesus Christ, right? And I, I just want to read this. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. This is a promise that the Lord makes. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Another version says it this way. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And again, it's a promise made to Israel, and we can look at that in the context of all that. And yet, I can't help but think, in saving us in Jesus, God has done the same thing in us, has he not? Has he not removed that hardened, stubborn heart and given us one that is 
A heart of flesh that's tender and responsive to the things of him. So that when we do sin or we come face to face in with ways of our own lack of godliness, we respond and we say, oh, I need you, Jesus, even more. I need you, right? And, and that we're sensitive to the things of him. And so all of these things are turned upside down. How are they done? Verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Um, it, implying that they did learn Christ in another way, and he sort of details what that is here. Um, but I just this is an intriguing way to describe salvation uh, to me. I don't know. It, it's really unique. I was looking at... Uh, other, um, well, other versions, but also trying to see other tr- uh, passages in Scripture that might describe this. Um, and I didn't see it anywhere else except here. But you did not learn Christ in this way. Um, other versions say learn about Christ or come to know Christ. Um, it, it, it seems that, that it's talking here about uh, the full sense of accepting Christ and his work and all of the implications of that into our life. Um, that, that we're not just learning, that for the Ephesians, for you and I today that are in Christ, that we're not just learning a set of doctrines, um, although we are learning doctrine. We're not learning just a list of do's and don'ts, although there are commands and there are things that we are called to obey and live out, but it's not a a legalistic type thing. We're not just, certainly not just learning uh, Bible facts and trivia. Um, Although those those are fun, um, especially anytime Jeopardy has the Bible category, man, I just, I know all the, I feel really smart. Um, And then they move on to like 15th century French literature. And I'm like, okay, forget about that. But anyhow, we're not just learning those, those things. This says what? We are learning, or that we have learned Christ, a a person, the Christ, Jesus himself. That that we see him and we see his life. And it's not just by the law, but by the gospel. It's Christ himself. That the church in Ephesus, they heard about, they were taught the truth of Jesus. And it was completely life-changing. Um. Yeah. What came to mind as I was thinking about that idea of learning Christ and that we have learned Christ, that we have, we have been taught and have heard. We've not seen him face to face, but we have his word. And so in that sense, he's very, very real. Um, we have others who have told us about him. And, and the, the, the story that came to mind was in John 4 of the woman at the well, Right. And I love that passage. If, you, if you're familiar with it, the woman at the well who's um, Jesus meets her there. The disciples have gone into town to buy some food and she's there and she's a Samaritan and Jews and Samaritans, you know, don't have any dealings. And yet Jesus asks her for some water and that leads into, well, if you knew who was asking you, you would ask me for water. I'd give you living water. And she doesn't get it. She's like, living water? Where, where can I get that? And, and it's a spiritual lesson that he's... And, that whole encounter, there's so much richness in just what is happening in her understanding. But it was the end of that story that came to mind as I was thinking about learning Christ. And so if you look back in John 4, this is, this is toward the very end of that. After the woman ran into town, um, Jesus has revealed to her that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah, right? And the mean, so she runs back into town. Meanwhile, the disciples come back and They're also confused. They don't get what's going on. But in verse 39 of John chapter 4, it says, Now from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him, in Jesus, because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I've done. All right? She's had this encounter with him, and I think you're a prophet. Oh, you're the Messiah. Oh, you know all about me. And then, verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, 
For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one truly is the Savior of the world. And I just love that. That, okay, yeah, it started with this woman, right? She's going back to her own people and saying, you've got to, is this the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? Um, and, and many of them believe because of what she said. But then they come and say, oh, no, wait. It's not just your word. This isn't secondhand. But we ourselves have learned him. <laughs> we have heard him. We've received, and he is the Savior. And isn't that our experience if we're in Christ? Uh, if we're truly saved, right? I mean, my parents shared with me the good news of Jesus, and so I became a believer. And yet, at some point in my life, that became very much internalized in that it's not just, I'm not depending on my parents' faith to save me. I'm not depending on their encounter with the Savior. It's because I have known him. It's because it's a personal thing. And so I think he's addressing this back in Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, you learned Christ, you've heard about him, you've been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. And then he goes on to say, now this is what I want you to do because of it, right? So you've done this, then reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, which means corrupted, Verse 23, that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds to put on the new self. So here then is really the practical, so what, I think, of this passage. Like, like okay, we see all these truths. We see the truths about these Gentiles and, and even describing us before we come to know Christ and this awesome thing that God's doing inwardly and then it has an effect outwardly. And that's what he's saying, too, I think, to the Ephesians. The, the Gentiles, the unbelieving, they, they, inwardly they're dead, they're without God, and so outwardly, what do you expect that's going to be their life? Now you, inwardly, have been changed. Now, as a result of that, outwardly, there should be a difference, right? And so he's talking here this language of taking off or putting off or throwing off the old self and putting on the new self. It's not so much a... I don't think it at all is referring to get saved as if there's some part that they're doing to complete or accomplish their salvation. No, Jesus has done all of that and who you are inside is now different. So then now, how do you live practically day to day? We take off that old self, that, that unbelieving part that was those actions that resulted, because that's not who you are anymore. That's not a description of your very identity. Jesus has changed that. And now you put on the new self. Um, much like, I mean, there's this image here of clothing, right? And so, you know, imagine if you were uh, homeless and walking the streets and begging for food, and all you had was this old ratty coat that barely covered and, you know, and it was falling apart and moth-ridden. And, and, and then someone who has just all these riches and just all the means says, hey, I'm going to invite you into my home. I'm going to clothe you. You're going to eat here with me. You're going to have a home. You're going to have a place to live. You don't have to do that anymore. Right? Your entire life has changed. How foolish and silly would you look then going around wearing that old coat when winter came, Right? No, you've got something much better now. You've got something on the outside that reflects who you truly are within. And so even beyond that analogy of like just, but, but it's, 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 it's inner salvation that Jesus is giving. And so now we're putting on that new self. And even here, verse 24, the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness, holiness of truth. There's this illusion of creation, Right? That the original creation in the image of God, and now this spiritual creation in Christ, again, in the image of God. And it's very much from Him. It's very much <laughs> that we're very passive in a lot of this, right? We're being renewed. Verse 23, in the spirit of your minds. That the Spirit is doing His renewing work in us. And as we are in the word of God and in the things of God, that he's working that and shaping our thinking more and more like the thinking of Christ. 
that we have this new life that has been created by God. So it's, there's that element of this that is very passive. We're receiving. We're not accomplishing anything in terms of our salvation. God has done it all. But what we're being encouraged to do here, I believe, is now live that out. Put it on. Walk in your daily life in a way that reflects who you've been made in Jesus. And so the gospel is here in that we're not performing and doing these things and trying to impress and being good just for the sake of being good so that others notice and, God, are you happy with me here? I've done, no, rather, God's saying, I've done all this in you. Now, live it out. And living in the freedom of who we are in Christ. Now, what does that look like in details? Well, for that, we'll have to wait until Pastor Scott comes back and picks up. Because verses 25 onward points out at some pretty specific things, right? Um, so, I guess... You can look through that, and if one of those sort of hits you in the heart, maybe you don't want to show up next week. No, no, no you still come, right? Because there's specific areas that that works out. But I think this passage is a foundation for what we'll go into next in terms of how that, the details of that work out. But for us today, I hope that we're encouraged with this reality that in Christ we've been created new. That in Christ, all of that stuff that described us once before God's taken care of that. And he's given us this life in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you uh, for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that this, this good news, the gospel, is truly good news. That it's not just good advice of shaping up and, and, and trying to be better or act better but rather it's good news that, God, you've made us new. You've created us to be like your son. And now this encouragement that now we want to live like that, that we have a new walk, a new way of living. And so, God, I would pray that uh, for those today that might be struggling with um, just this reality, Lord, for those that just need a reminder of your goodness, God, that the gospel is, yeah, it's for the lost to become saved, but your good news is for us as believers too, God. We need it every day, that we need to continually depend upon the grace of um, your grace to us in Jesus, that we are living our lives um, out of who you've made us in Christ. We just thank you for that. Thank you, um, praying that, You would continue to be with the church here. Thank you for this church. Thank you for how you're working in each individual lives, in the community. And Father, pray that this this church will continue to be just a beacon and a lighthouse out into the surrounding communities and neighborhoods and homes and lives of people who uh, do not know you. Just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.